Welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Well, I've started reviewing two series of science fiction and fantasy novels in the past with the Cities in Flight series and the Lunium covering science fiction and fantasy respectively. And I finished neither. So, let's start a third series of books while I'm at it. But worry not, my friends. I have already finished reading the entire series in an omnibus volume, as I showed in my last Nintendo Power Retrospective video. So... This time, we will have some closure, and yes, I do plan on finishing reviewing those other two series. This week, though, I'm taking a look at one of the incarnations of Michael Moorcock's Eternal Champion, with the first part of the Hawkmoon series, The Jewel in the Skull. Now, for the um, images I'll be using in this video and the other video reviews of the books, I'm going to be using images from the graphic novels. The graphic novels use the same, it's the same story, they don't change it, I'm just using it because it's easier to illustrate the visuals going on in there. These don't necessarily represent the visuals I had in my head when I was reading the books, um, but it gives you an idea of what things might look like. I'm not going to comment much on the art here, um, and I'll just, I'm, I'm focusing on the plot, I'm using them for the criticism of the plot, so... Don't misinterpret this as being a review of the comics as much as a review of the story that the two, uh, that the comics have in common with the book. So, let's get started. The book is set in a sort of amalgam of a fantasy post-apocalyptic future, with elements of both magic as traditional magic, and magic as sufficiently advanced technology, at least as far as most of the characters are concerned. The story follows Dorian Hawkmoon, the ruler of the city of Kohn in Germany. I'm mispronouncing that. After being defeated in battle by the forces of the Dark Empire of Grand Britain, Hawkmoon has the titular jewel implanted in his skull, essentially a magical device that lets the rulers of Grand Britain see what he sees and kill him if he attempts treachery. Grand Britain is ruled by Emperor King Huan, who is immortal but confined to his throne globe, which maintains his life. Now, before you do the... Oh, the kind of thing that makes me start quoting the I hope you like text penny arcade script and saying, oh hey, that's a total ripoff of Warhammer 40k or what have you. Jewel in the Skull was published in 1967. Warhammer 40k didn't come out until 1987, so unless Michael Moorcock has access to time travel, he can't have ripped off Warhammer. Now, that said, Games Workshop, they, they paid homage to Moorcock in the past, particularly with doing a bunch of stuff with the dichotomy between law and chaos and that sort of thing, so it's probably yet another homage to Moorcock's. A note about Grand Britannian society. While the people of Grand Britannia are technologically and magically advanced, the people of Grand Britannia have also become somewhat scarred and deformed and are vain and ashamed of their appearance. Thus, the soldiers and knights of Grand Britannia all wear armor and helmets with face-covering masks, and often even sleep in their armor and masks to keep people from seeing their true faces. Often these masks and helms have motifs of whatever order of knighthood they are part of, and each order has their own private secret language. Also in this world exists a powerful relic of the Rune Staff, symbol of the balance between law and chaos, which is sought after by the forces of the Dark Empire, at the hope that with it they could conquer the world and then travel beyond, taking their conquest to the stars. According to legend, the Runestaff lies in the far-off land to the east of Europe, Asia Communista. Remember, this is a post-apocalyptic setting. So, rather than so saving a fantasy alternate Earth, so names are kind of modifications of present-day names. Why am I not showing you pictures? Because we don't actually see the Runestaff, we don't see it depicted until much later, and nobody goes to Asia Communista, so there's no depiction of that. Hawkmoon is sent by Emperor Huan, and the Baron Melanatus of Croydon, to the land of Camarg, home of Count Brass, in order to kill the Count and kidnap his daughter, Isilda. After Count Brass rebuffed Melanatus, 
and his entreaties on behalf of the Dark Empire to get the Count to side with Grand Bretagne willingly, as opposed to conquering them, as is their usual way they do things. However, these plans turn out somewhat for naught, as Count Brass and his advisor, Beau Gentle, detect the treachery and tempor temporarily disable the gem. Melanotis, in revenge, sends an army against Castle Brass, but thanks to the combined efforts of Hawkmoon and the Count, they are rebuffed through guerrilla warfare and open warfare. Hawkmoon also begins to fall in love with Isilda. However, this respite and, their, and triumph are short-lived, as the release control of the gemstone is temporary. So Hawkmoon is sent to the Middle East to, to find the city of Hamadan, and there find a wizard named Malagi, Malagigi, who could release the gemstone's control. On his way to Hamadan, Hawkmoon meets Oladan, a half-giant who comes to his, the aid of Hawkmoon when Hawkmoon is captured by a sorcerer. The two escape, the, both the sorcerer and the forces of the Dark Empire, before finally reaching Hamadan, where they help the queen's ruler, Queen Fraubra, stop a coup attempt by her brother, who was backed by Melanotis and the Dark Empire. In this task, they are also aided by the mysterious warrior in jet and gold, who claims that Hawkmoon is an aspect of the Champion Eternal of the Rune Staff, a symbol of the cosmic balance. The three, Hawkmoon, Oladon, and the warrior in jet and gold, join Queen Frabra's forces in the coming battle, and Hawkmoon engages Baron Melanotis in combat, and somewhat overcomes him. However, Melanotis' body is not found. After saving the day and the endorsement of both the Queen and the Warrior in Chet and Gold, Malagigi renders the jewel inert. However, Hawkmoon decides to leave the jewel where it is, as a symbol of his desired revenge against Grand Bretagne and the Dark Empire. As the story ends, he and Oladon prepare to return to Camarg. I will say that while these books are dark, they're post-apocalyptic, and they're grim, there's the looming specter of the Dark Empire over all of Europe, and they do nasty, terrible things to people, it's actually not as nihilistic a work as the Elric series. The Elric series, folk, I mean, there's, it's, because of Stormbringer, there's, Ultimately, actually, Stormbringer sucks the life out of the setting the same way it's, he sucks the souls of the people Elric kills. Because no matter how many successes Elric has, no matter how many victories he wins, he still has this sword which he cannot escape, and this looming destiny he's stuck with. Uh, and it gives the stories a very impressive, uh, op oppressive tone. Where, uh, in fact, there are very few comic relief characters there. Elric is... Elric is angsting over the fact that he has a sword that he doesn't totally control and eats people's souls, including, well, the souls of his friends and his love and his loved ones. In fact, the only comic relief in the Elric series at all is occasionally Moonglum will crack wise or say something tongue-in-cheek, and that provides the comedy, the only comedy of the setting. Here, though, well... Hawkmoon makes quips. Um, Hawkmoon's companion, Oladon, makes quips. Count um, Brass is a boisterous, cheerful man when he's in a good mood. Um, and, it, it, and by boisterous and cheerful, I mean like Brian Blessed, boisterous and cheerful. Um, really, it is a setting. It is a setting where there is darkness here. There is oppression in this world because it's post-apocalyptic and you can't escape that. But there are rays of light, and that I think makes it makes the Hawkmoon series, to a certain extent, a little more appealing, a little more approachable than um, than well than Elric. Elric is more well known, but I think if you're coming into Michael Moorcock for the first time, I would say that Hawkmoon is a good place to come in. It still fits in nicely the Trail Champion storyline, but it's a slower burn. It, build things up more, as this volume has teases at the ultimate destiny of Hawkmoon and his role in the cosmic balance. But it's 
it's a fun sword and sorceries novel. It's one that avoids the racist and misogynist elements that occasionally come in the works of other fantasy authors like the Conan series. So there's also that as well. Um, I think that if you're not the biggest fan of swords and sorcery, if you find it difficult getting into Conan, or if you're coming into Michael Moorcock for the first time because you've heard a recommendation of his stuff, this is the place to come in on. I really recommend you check out this book. And next time, I'll be, take, I'll be taking a look at the second book, The Mad God's Amulet, and I'll see you then.